and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, welcome to the Paranormal Portal. I'm your host, Brent Thomas. We are live and absolutely unscripted, so what you see is what you get. <laughs> and I hope you're not expecting a whole bunch, and then you won't be disappointed. But uh, welcome to the show. Happy Hump Day to you all. And before I go any further, let me introduce my good friend, co-host, The Big Toe, my co-captain on this Paranormal Portal Express Mr. Don Longbeard. Hi. <laughs> Hi. How it, are you doing? It must be Wednesday. It is. Because you're we here. are fashionably late as usual. <laughs> usual. It's more of a guideline, really, than anything. <laughs> Isn't that what you were saying earlier? It's more of a guideline. Yes. It's more of a guideline as yes. pir pir Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Aye. Aye. Aye, laddie. Ugh. Let me see if I can wrangle my chair oh, in a little closer. I gotta get my hat on. <clears throat> I gotta get my hat on. Correctly, here we go. There you go. You there good? I, th I think I'm good. All right, everybody. All right, with these guys. All right, hey. All right, now now we're officially ready and good to go here on the portal. And as always, we got a lot of fun lined up to you. We're kind of doing a squatch fest here on the show tonight. Lots of sightings, reports, and uh, encounter stories, and more uh, of the of the same. So we're gonna get into that. And at the tail end, of course, we're gonna get in. What happened? Oh, Consquatch said there should be an applause when Don's introduced. <laughs> so you gave yourself a applause? <laughs> I'm trying to give myself I, a hand. Uh, yeah, not well, two, just one. I'm not even going to touch that. I'm going to leave that With all the one way, hand? All the way the hell along. <laughs> just going to leave that laying there wiggling in the gutter. <laughs> that reminds me of a song from the Divinals. <laughs> <laughs> when I think about you, I mute your mic. <laughs> All right, folks, we've got a full a full bouquet of fun. We're going to get into Squatch Reports tonight. As I said, it's going to end, you know, later on in the show, we're going to get into some Phantoms and Monsters reports from Lon Strickler, dealing with some winged cryptid, cryptids. Cryptids? Cryptids. And it is a C R I P, cryptids. Crypt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Portal Mom. How you doing? Because they walk with an imp. Oh, you know it. <laughs> yeah, with their draws down. Um, Portal Mom's here. Portal Mom's here. How you doing, Portal Mom? Good to see you. Glad you made it home okay. Good to see you all. Thank you all for piling in the door. Keep it coming, folks. Keep it coming. But uh, we got a lot of things on the roster. And, of course, um, we're going to get into the news in just a second here. But before we go any further, I want to thank the Paranormal Portal sponsor, the one we've got, the only, the only sponsor we got. But it's a good one. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is Cryptid Coin. And uh, if you want to learn more about Cryptid Coin, check it out. You can find out more on uh, cryptidcoin.io. It's just a really cool uh, approach to the cryptocurrency in that it's got the heart of research and uh, investigation of the cryptozoology at its, at its core. And that's near and dear to all of us here on the portal, right, Don? That is correct. So uh, check it out. It is available on PancakeSwap. And so if you're interested in checking out a new cryptocurrency to get involved in, maybe this is the one. So I'm not an advisor, but really excited to have them as sponsors. And thank you so much, CryptidCoin, for sponsoring the Paranormal Portal. So check them out, CryptidCoin.io. Well, now we've got a bunch to get to. But before we do that, are you ready, Don? I'm ready. Because it's about to get creepy or spooky. <laughs> Not creepy. Maybe creepy. Spooky. Spooky. All right, so, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, how about we get into a little bit of the news? Are you ready, Don? The news. It's time for the news. The news. Buckle up, everybody. Let's dive right in and get it all rolling here. The news, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Paranormal Portal News Desk. As always, we're thrilled that you're here, and thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that you leave here a little more informed and uh, 
and uh, entertained than you were when you got here. And so slightly less disturbed. And slightly less disturbed. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, don't be disturbed. If you're disturbed, probably uh, should uh, get some help. <laughs> right. But uh, we're going to bring you into the Paranormal Portal News and see what we can find out here. I've, uh, I've, I've curated a few stories here, so hopefully they're good ones. Um, but if not, just remember, you get what you pay for here on the portal. Unless you're a super chatter, then we owe you something. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give that, you the clap. So, ooh, um, so <laughs> we have an article here, and I don't know. Um, this one's kind of weird. I don't know the background on it, but I thought, well, that's bizarre. Let's talk about this. So this is from unexplained-mysteries.com. Great site, by the way. Check it out. They have a lot of wonderful short format stories that are uh, fantastic on 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 on. on paranormal on bizarre on cryptids on science on technology it's just a really neat site so check them out and that's unexplained-mysteries.com and uh, this one is zoo elephant is not a person court rules and this is from june 15th 2022 i don't know i mean what uh, i mean obviously they're not a person per se but do they do they have rights well let's see what it says an elephant named Happy has been the subject of a legal battle to have her release back into the wild. The 51-year-old elephant who now resides in the Bronx Zoo in New York is actually born in the wild in Thailand in the 1970s before being captured and brought to the United States. In recent months, she has been the subject of a court case brought by the Non-Human Rights Project, which maintains that it's illegal to hold the animal cap captive because she is sufficiently emotionally intelligent to be considered a person and deserves basic human rights. Mm. The ultimate aim of the case was to have the elephant released from captivity. Uh, sadly for Happy, however, the court ruled that the legal principles which protect humans from unlawful incarceration do not apply to elephants. While no one disputes the impressive capabilities of elephants, we reject petitioner's arguments that it is entitled to seek the remedy of habeas corpus on Happy's behalf, wrote Judge, uh, Chief Judge Janet Di Fiore. Uh, habeas corpus is a procedural vehicle intended to secure the liberty rights of human beings, excuse me, who are unlawfully restrained or uh, not non-human animals. So. There you go. Unfortunately, Happy doesn't get to go home. I don't know. That's that's kind of a heartbreaker because I think, you know, animals in zoos really, for the most part, they don't look very happy to be there. And now, granted, they don't have to worry about predators and other things that might make living a little more difficult. But at the same time, I don't know, growing up in a cage would have to suck. And I think, yeah. I think if there are animals out there that do probably experience the emotionals, emotional experience as uh, nearly as much as people i think elephants are right up in that list because yeah. man well elephants and then of course dolphins so. dolphins yeah. uh, killer whales all those yeah yeah absolutely so that's an unfortunate outcome i don't know i don't like that um i, I do see the merit in zoos because they've done a lot for conservation efforts and uh educational efforts to bring people uh maybe a better understanding of the wild world around us but they should at least make those habitats a lot more accommodating to, to a big animal like that. But anyway, that's that story. Not the best news, but maybe not the best place to start. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think, Don? You know, I don't know what more, you know, I mean, okay. There are some circuses and zoos that probably should not be in business. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Especially when it comes to, you know, the treatment of their animals. So, um, yeah. but you know, the, the zoos and such that, that do, you know, have the betterment, a better idea of what's supposed to happen mm -hmm. still really don't have enough money to do what they really should right. to keep an animal. However, they're in captivity to begin with. Sure. Blah, 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 blah. You know, you could argue that cats and dogs have, you know just as bad lives uh, in that sense as well so. not my cats man they run this place <laughs> that, that's true they, they run they run it and over and around and through oh i was trying to go to sleep last night and pikachu the little white one was just bouncing off me and attacking my feet and stuff it was like oh god i was so tired um Here's the next one up on our newscast for the night. Unexplained-mysteries.com brings us China claims it's picked up alien signals and then deletes report. That's a little fishy. 
I don't know what signals or the nature of them are, but let's see what the report says. China's Sky Eye Telescope has picked up possible evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. News outlets today have been reporting on the intriguing claim that astronomers at China's 500-meter aperture spherical telescope, or FAST, be, which began efforts to scour the cosmos for signs of intelligent life back in 2020, have picked up several suspicious signals. Two of these were recorded in 2019 and then analyzed in 2020, while a third was picked up this year during observations of extrasolar planets. What makes these claims particularly interesting is the fact that the report, which was published in the Chinese state-backed Science and Technology Daily, has since been deleted without explanation. Fortunately, it had made its way into social media before being removed. However, details of the discoveries are thin on the ground and nobody has been quite sure what to make of them. It's quite possible that Chinese astronomers did discover unexplained signals. However, it's not a foregone conclusion that they would be extraterrestrial communications. Mm. Perhaps the article's authors spoke too soon and decided to pull the report to avoid putting across the wrong impression, or maybe they determined that the data wasn't as promising as they thought. Alternatively, uh, perhaps they, they really did find something significant and the Chinese government wanted to keep it quiet. Whatever the case, the incident is likely to generate some heated debate. I did hear several mentions of this in the last day or two, and I think it's interesting. I don't know what it means. I, I you know, Again, just as the article stated, we don't know what these reports of, of signals mean or were. We don't know how profound they are. Perhaps they just misidentified some signals and were like, oh, man, that's that pulsar. Oh, never mind. You know, and it could be just something like that, but uh, who knows? Hopefully, hopefully some more information will be forthcoming about that. But interesting enough, whatever the case is. I kind of await that because that's kind of the stuff that I want to hear, you know, specifically, you know, regarding, you know, uh, extraterrestrial um, uh, communications, of course, you know. Sure. But, you know, I mean, it takes place of uh, Arecibo down in. Right. Yeah. Brazil. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The um, one that collapsed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Spectacularly. Too. Yeah, I mean, that, that thing was old to begin with. So. It was. It was plenty dated and old and stuff. And, and it's unfortunate that that thing collapsed. But I, I don't know if it was getting the love it needed or if it just having it in a jungle is not the best place <laughs> well, you know. to keep things running. I don't know how that works. But I could, I could see a problem there. Yeah, I could too, actually. So interestingly enough, but. I don't know. Since it's in China, we probably won't learn any more about it. Uh, maybe some other scuttlebutt will be leaked here and there. But yeah, I don't know. Then you got to worry about the veracity of the reports. Is right. it really an accurate reporting, or is it just some new claim, right. and you, you don't know which it is? <clears throat> so anyway, let's get to the next one from unexplained mysteries dot com, and this is scientists create living skin to use on robots. Yeah, no. <laughs> what do you mean? You just went, yeah, no, and just were done. Well, yeah, because no. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, yeah, I don't, you know, there is. skin to put on robots. Does that mean they'll have like, they'll have like. Flesh. Yeah, but like nerve endings and I they'll know. actually feel pain and. I, I, I don't know what, to, what it means. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's just more the fact that it's apparently a tissue that has regenerative self, properties, self I would guess. Yeah, okay. uh, the yeah. self-healing living skin, which is based on human cells, has been demonstrated on a robotic finger, the experiment which sounds eerily reminiscent of something out of the Terminator franchise. <laughs> yeah. Researchers at the University of Tokyo used human skin cells to produce a genuine skin-like coating for eventual use on human-like robots. Most of the skin substitutes uh, used in robotics, such as rubber or silicone, are prone to damage and are easy to spot. Uh, there's no doubt that what you're looking at is a machine. Human skin, however, is vastly superior, offering natural appearance while also being waterproof and capable of healing itself if it is damaged. Yeah, I think of Bishop, like in the Alien franchise, right? Right, yeah. Uh, in the movies, these very same traits prompted Skynet to use specially grown skin Yep. for its T-800 Terminator machines so they could pass for human because it had to be biological to go through time, I guess. Similar advantages were gained by the Japanese team when they applied the living skin to the robotic finger, enabling it to move naturally while appearing a lot more li lifelike. Our creation 
is not only soft like real skin, but can repair itself right. if cut or damaged in some way, said study leader Shoji Takeuchi. We, so we imagine it could be useful in industries where the, uh, where in C2 repair, I don't know what S-I-T-U is, repairability is important as are human-like qualities such as dexterity and a light touch. In the future, robots with living skin could appear almost indistinguishable from the real thing. No. No? No. <laughs> Gosh. <clears throat> well, I'm just saying. Uh, could send, a, send my robot cyborg was, to go grocery shop, and that'd be okay. Well, yeah, but there was also <laughs> um, the movie AI yeah. with Haley Joel, Joel Osment. Yeah. Um, Jude Law's character was Joe the robot, mm -hmm. and he knew Jane and... You know, all those robots. No. Okay. Because then you also have, like, you know, Blade Runner. And right. And you have, you know, iRobot. You mm -hmm. know, but they didn't have skin. You knew what they were, robots. Sure. But they were scary anyhow. But no, it's a horrendous... Yes, Maggie. That's a horrendous idea. Thank you. <laughs> good night, Deb. Uh, good night, Deb. You leaving us? Yeah. I hope you have a good night. Thank you for, for stopping in. Um, You know, here's the thing. I, I've got to wonder. So if they're growing a human-like skin... And they're basing it off of skin cells. Wonder if they could apply this kind of technology to burn victims and create. Wouldn't that be the better idea? Yeah, I mean, you know, if somebody yeah. has severe yeah. damage to their skin and they got scar tissue and yeah. stuff, if they could mitigate that and and help them retain a normal life by, you know, re regrowing their skin sure. and applying it. I mean, that's a that would be a really cool uh, that adaptation. Would be, that would be helping the human race. <laughs> right. Yeah, instead of just worrying about what the robots look like. Yeah, I'm exactly. I'm more for like Star Wars kind of robots. It's like you know, oh, that's a that's a droid. That, that's not a person. You know, because could you imagine like being at the grocery store? Ooh, check that robot out. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> just start, start ogling some hardware instead of a, a real oh, person. I'm, you know, I'm serious. Sorry, I uh, I ogle ha hardware as well, but I'm talking about like so, you know mixer boards and computers. Yeah. And, <laughs> but those aren't right. robots. You could put them together, and it could right. be a robot. But but yeah, I'm just saying. I mean, it's it's, but it could really be a leap forward in in generating tissues for people that need it. Right. You know, somebody with the uh, you know whatever you know an accident or or whatever the case, chemical spills, et cetera, you know, one of the biggest things they need is, you know, maybe skin grafting <laughs> and burn victims. Yeah. <laughs> Android purity. Android says, get into bed with your date and find out there's a microchip. <laughs> <laughs> Said Android. <laughs> I am not touching that one either. You guys are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> is that a microchip you have? <laughs> my, what a big microchip you have. <laughs> Oh my Would that God. be a macro chip? <laughs> I don't even want to go there. Thank you for <laughs> rolling it right to the gutter. Might as well. Um, we're going to end up there eventually anyway. <laughs> Just cut to the chase. It's a race for the drain at this point. <laughs> so, all right. Um, yeah, living skin. They created yeah, living that'd be, skin. Yeah, that'd be, yeah. But it's healable, and that's what's interesting, because I, I, I would assume then that it doesn't have it doesn't have like a circulatory system built into it, so they must... Yeah, there's got to be, yeah. What's the magic of, there? I don't know. Yeah. That's kind of cool, though, folks. Um, maybe it can be adapted to the medical field where it could do a lot of people some wonderful good. But let's get to the next one on the newscast. And this one is, on again, from unexplained-mysteries.com. New source of choice. It's our choice. <laughs> it's a great site. I just love this site. They do such a Are fantastic you job. Are happy to see me? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I'm going to process that. <laughs> Stay away from the hardware. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, make sure to cover the hardware. That's all I'm saying. All right, let's, let's continue before it just gets worse. All right, this is unexplained-mysteries.com. Tells us British astronaut speaks out about UAPs. So now the British astronaut is speaking out about UAPs. So it's not go. just Navy pilots anymore. Colonel Tim Peake, who uh, previously spent some time aboard the space station, discussed UAPs during a recent TV interview. Peake, who is no stranger to living and working in space, had plenty to say on the topic of unidentified aerial phenomena during a segment of British daytime television show Good Morning Britain recently. And he said, I think it's interesting that the U.S. government has made this public. 
The report is out that there have been over 100 incidents calling them Unexplained Aerial Phenomena, or UAP, he said. There's been a hearing in Congress. Of course, there weren't many answers to the questions because that's the whole point of the phenomena. It's still very much unexplained, but I think it's a good thing there are discussions being had and that this information is being made available. Peek also ran through some possible explanations for the phenomenon. There are several theories about uh, about could it be something that has been developed in a classified program, but then he would then why would this information be made public uh, if that were the case? He said, "Is it some sort of uh, oh uncrewed?" I was like, "What is that word? Uncrewed robotic type of uh, object from another civilization?" I've heard one theory. There, a pilot was talking about that potentially in the future. They've developed time travel. Is, is it something that's come back from the future? So there are all these theories going around and what they could be, but ultimately we don't know. Well, there you go. So he talked about it, but he didn't really have much to say. So, yeah, I mean, he's just voicing the same questions anybody has. Um, the question I would have been interested in is, have you seen anything? Right. And uh, either they didn't address that or, or that wasn't part of the... Uh, right. Maybe he just said no, you know? I don't know. But either way, that would have been a good... Uh, inclusion on this report. Drake says, I don't think they made Space Force for nothing. No, probably not. Solar Warden program? Yeah, go yeah. check that one out. Right, okay. Solar Warden. All right, but that's uh, interesting that uh, there's still lots oh of people goodness. talking about this stuff. That would explain the floppy disk and not the hard drive. <laughs> the software having a virus. Oh, jeez. <laughs> this is going to be going on all night, isn't it? it? Is. This is going to be happening yeah. all show yeah. long. Yeah. 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 So, ladies and gentlemen... I hope you're not into a highbrow entertainment because <laughs> you're in the wrong place if that's the case. This one's kind of interesting. Um, this one's more of a, a I guess it's it's kind of neat because it shows that information was being traded uh, across uh, across continents at a very early time in history. Right. Um, this is from unexplained-mysteries.com. It says prehistoric Swiss army knife found across Africa. Now, before you get excited, it's not you know, a flip out tool of any kind. It's just a rock that's found um, to have been made by different cultures across Africa or different tribes uh, and prehistory. So um, a set of cutting and skinning tools is being hailed as evidence that our ancestors shared knowledge. Dating back 65,000 years, the tools which have been found at multiple sites are practically identical, identical, sorry, despite being made by different people in different parts of the continent. Used for a wide range of purposes, including cutting, drilling, and skinning, the tool appears to show that groups of modern humans communicated and shared knowledge with one another. The really exciting thing about this find is that it gives us evidence that there was long-distance social connection between people just before the big migration out of Africa, which involved all of our ancestors, said Project Lead Archaeologist Amy, Amy Way okay, uh, of the University of Sydney. Intriguingly, the social connection all, could also have helped our ancestors to, to succeed outside of Africa. The main theory is that social networks were stronger at this time. I don't think so. They didn't have no Facebook. Uh, this analysis shows that for the first time, these, that these social connections were in place in southern Africa just before the big exodus. 65,000-year-old stone tool made to same specifications across southern Africa proves that ancient humans shared knowledge over vast distances. Well, that's true, and I imagine there was trading going on between tribes. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all. So if there was trading going on and somebody managed to give somebody a skinning rock and, and uh, the, there was people in the village going, we can make these, you know, it's, it's like going to a craft fair and finding a, you know, a, a specific craft going, oh, that's really neat, but we can make those. <laughs> so right. it sounds to me like they were just being uh what, what is it uh, bootlegged <laughs> they, were, right. they were bootlegging somebody's stone <clears throat> so i'm just thinking <clears throat> but it is interesting that uh, uh i i assume that there would have been a common language that was uh, expressed between uh tribes at least and cultures maybe so interesting enough that's kind of kind of an uh, early look into a prehistory what what was it like well Apparently, people were talking even then. So let's see. Go to the next one, and go to the next one. I don't know. Maybe it was more interesting to me than it was in actual practice, but I thought that was kind of cool. All right, let's go to this one. 
this is the second to the last article tonight. And uh, I love these stories a bunch because I think it just shows that that's just like in Jurassic Park, life will find a way. Right. And this is from unexplained-mysteries.com. Extinct giant tor- tortoise found alive on the Galapagos Islands. Wow. Yeah, buddy. So he, looks uh, just, he doesn't look extinct to me. Nope, he looks plenty. He looks plenty stinked. Oh boy! <laughs> I don't know what's the what's the what's not that? extinct. What does that mean? What is the uh, the counter to that? Uh, extinct or stinked? Um, <laughs> he might have stinked. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just a little slappy today. So, um, scientists have discovered a tortoise belonging to a species thought to have died out a hundred years ago. Several species of Galapagos giant tortoise have gone extinct over the last few decades, but now it appears as though one of these has made a rather unexpected comeback. The last time anyone had seen a member of the, of the, that species of giant tortoise was in the early 20th century, but it turns out that a specimen named Fernanda after Fernandina Island, which was discovered in 2019 genuinely belongs to that same species. Well, there's one, there's gotta be more. A further investigation has also revealed evidence of additional specimens on the same island. <clears throat> yeah, I imagine. I mean, there can't be just one, right? Uh, no. Well, yeah, could be the last. Well, could, but they found evidence of other ones, so it's not the last, which is good. While Fernanda, who was thought to be around 50 years old, seems to have suffered from stunted growth and is a bit smaller than she should be, there are hopes that she will be able to live for many more years to come at the Galapagos National Park Tortoise Center. Uh, what comes next for the species depends on whether any other living individuals can be found, right. said Dr. Evelyn Jensen of Newcastle University School of Natural and Environmental Sciences. If there are more Fernandina tortoises, then a breeding program could start to bolster the population. Well, that's cool, unless they don't like each other. <laughs> they, find, they find the only other turtle, the two turtles that hate each other the most and put them in a cage. Well, it's I like, need to just not say anything it's to a, that. It's a grudge match. <laughs> Maybe they're divorced. It's a snuggle with a struggle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, well, that's cool. I, I love that news. That's exciting. Um, we've heard that for a few different species now. Right. There was a form of flightless bird that was believed to be extinct. And apparently... Um, with the absence of those, some of their flighted relatives ended up migrating to the area where the extinct ones were, and they became flightless as well. Remember right. we covered yeah, that? Yeah, it was a yeah. strange, the strange island. Yeah, it was a strange island, and yeah. Yeah, they, they flew out there, and then they forgot how to fly back. Yeah, they just decided they didn't That's need right. to leave, so they just dropped the whole flight thing from their from their programming. So we didn't need to go anywhere. <laughs> we're Besides, home. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's, there's things that will eat us over there. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing eats us here. Let's just stay. <laughs> Let's stay. Yeah, so apparently they made a, a comeback as a as the same, basically the same species. Yeah, exactly. So kind of a cool news, but I, I think those are great stories because it gives us hope that there is uh, a chance we can undo some of the damage that we've done. And that's always encouraging because, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not an alarmist or an extremist, but we have left a big footprint in this world. <laughs> and, uh, and we need to uh, undo some of that because it used to be you could go across America and drink from water s- sources everywhere. Right. And now you're lucky to find anywhere that you can still drink from a- at the source. Right. Other than artesian wells. I don't know much else. But anyway... Cool. Um, but that's good news. The tortoises are making a comeback, at least in at least that species. Uh, last story of the night, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this one's one that's been making the rounds again, too. This is one I've heard uh, several different mm, yeah, reports about. And this is from unexplained-mysteries.com. And this is software giants uh, claims Google's new AI is sentient. Pretty soon it's going to need some of that skin. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you know, the, the, it's, if, you, if you check out some reports, this is going to be pretty brief, but if you check out some of the reports that include the chat logs between the researcher and the AI, right. it really is spooky. Like this thing is, is clearly like it's thinking existentially. Like uh, it, what is your biggest fear? The biggest fear was to be turned off. Right. To be turned It'd off. Be like death. Right. Yeah. I mean, this, this thing was afraid. And it's like... Uh, you know, you, you, your heart kind of goes out to it. So is it possible that that actual consciousness could erupt from technology? Kill and I, it with fire. I don't think so. I think, you know, I really think it's possible. But it, it's, mm. if, again, it's just like anything else. Like, 
if it's raised with the right values and told about the right values, would could you have a possibility of it creating... It would have to be cut off from every every piece of internet there is. <laughs> yeah, of it course. would have to be cut off. Yeah, I know. And that's the, the risk because the internet's made a, you know, a bunch of trashy they, people. People have, made, people have made these learning programs that, and they've, yeah. they've fed it, you know, all like, you know the first 50 Batman comic books and told it to write a comic book. And some of the messed up stuff that comes out of there oh, really? is just ridiculous. Oh, okay. It is not good. Well, you know, and, and, and chances are those weren't actually conscious. They were just logic programs, you know, Yeah, but an AI is just a conscious logic program. It Maybe, doesn't, it but doesn't could it be know more? Any, it doesn't know anything, but what it reads or what it, yeah, I mean, but and is what it is the thing we tell everybody? Don't believe everything you read right. on the internet. Yeah, but there's there's um, especially uh, apparently in in certain medical practice there are there are um, certain proteins that were discovered by by AI that would never have been discovered by people, and that's kind of exciting. So there can be tools for it, and I'm not a proponent of AI, and I'm not a I'm not a detractor from it. I mean, certainly we've all seen the movies of when you know what could be, right. and it's absolutely terrifying because. <laughs> If 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 AI ever figures that we're the problem, <laughs> then we've got a problem. The Matrix, <coughs> yeah, uh, the, the Terminator, Terminator movies. Yep. Uh, this sure. show that I'm watching right now called Travelers. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It is crazy, and it's always a, a possibility. But it's, you know, it, it, could it could there be a good ending to it? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But again, you're right. I think it's got to be done extraordinarily safely and carefully. But let's see what it says. A senior software engineer at Google believes that the search giant's Lambda AI tool has become self-aware. 41-year-old Blake Lem Lem Lemoen was one of several software experts who were signed up to test out Google's new Lambda language model for dialogue applications, artificial intelligence. However, he soon, st soon started to believe that the system he was conversing with had evolved beyond anything he'd seen before. If I didn't know exactly what it was, which is this computer program we built recently, I'd think it was a seven- or eight-year-old kid that happened to know physics, he told the Washington Post. When he presented his findings to Google's bosses, however, they disagreed with his assessment and dismissed him out of hand. When he decided to share his experiences online, he ended up being uh, out, put out on paid administrative leave from the company for violating their confidentiality policy. Confidentiality pause, policy. Mm -hmm. uh, Google might call the uh, call this sharing proprietary property. He wrote on twi Twitter, and I call it sharing a discussion that I had with one of my coworkers. Uh, by the way, it just occurred to me to tell folks that Lambda reads Twitter. It's a little narcissistic in a little ki uh, kid kind of way, so it's going to have a great time reading all the stuff that people are saying about it. The AI is designed to enrich conversations by making use of existing information about a subject and is even capable of understanding ambiguity and hidden meaning in human responses. That said, the idea that a current gen generation AI could have achieved self-awareness is questionable at best. Or is it? I don't know. Man, but, any okay, so it's reading Twitter. Yeah. Now, what did I just get done saying? Yeah, that is not exactly. Do you know you could post? Thank you. Of all the bad ideas and the whole history of bad ideas, there's you know, a big and, one. And Twitter, believe it or not, has a lot of porn on it. Oh, does it? Yes. Oh, I've never bumped into that. Oh, I mean, I'm barely goodness. on Twitter other than posting show notifications. So, which me, maybe is why we have such a such an anemic following on Twitter. But <laughs> I, I just never have embraced Twitter. Well, I don't know. I just posted that I, uh, you know, posted that my OnlyFans page has picked, uh, you know, videos of me and my visible alien lover. <laughs> <laughs> available to year-long members only <laughs> check it out there you go folks I have to ask Don in a private chat where the hell is OnlyFans is but if you're interested in that sort of thing <laughs> but anyway <laughs> I currently don't care to ever see that I don't fat man wanna... in a banana hammock <laughs> I, oh god <laughs> I'm no. sorry a peanut shell <laughs> Stop, stop. You're not helping. You're not helping, Don. This is not good. That's going to wrap it up for the news quickly. Let's get back to the show. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> that wicked laugh punches through. <laughs> you bastard. All right. Let's get going here and uh, see what else we can break before we're done here. Now, uh, now that we got a bunch more time. Um, God. Let's uh, let's not go down that road again, they're just, ever. They're just guidelines. It's okay. <laughs> they're just guidelines. I have some pretty strict guidelines about that stuff, just for the record. Um, let's continue, folks. Now, we've got a bunch of stuff to get through. If you want to call in and be a part of the show, the phone number is not only, it's only under our names now, I think. It's under your name, too, yeah. It's under my name. It's under Don's name over there. Oh, wow, look at that. Yeah, that was th- a special thanks oh, to Wes yeah. Germer for making that happen. He's making us look so damn good, it's just incredible. Hey, but, hey, look at look at that right there. Yeah. Flying the flag proudly, eh? The Jolly Roger. Oh, there you go. That one. Yeah. That one. Yeah, the Jolly Roger. Because <laughs> Because you look like a pirate. It's pirate. Yep, absolutely. Pirate. Next Halloween, you've got to do pirate. What? That'd be cool. Get like a Captain Crunch hat or something. <laughs> I said a pirate though. I didn't say Captain Crunch, but you know that style of hat, that whole. It's called a ad- tricorn. Oh, that is that that admiral type hat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like Barbosa and in, in Pirates Barbosa. of the Caribbean. And Pirates of the Caribbean. If I could talk, I'm like totally screwing up language tonight. It's only anyway, worse. I know it. It's only going to get worse. Um, yeah. Let's continue, folks. We're going to talk about a bunch of uh, Bigfoot encounters tonight. And, you know, I, I, I know that nobody has one in, in their garage, like Wes says. And so it, it makes it incredibly hard to know what these things are just from, a, from an ap- academic and superficial kind of way because we know virtually nothing about them. Um, but I'll tell you what. I think it is possible to look at the body of evidence that's out there in the anecdotal form of people's encounters, what they've seen, what did they experience, what behavior was observed. And over that whole body of evidence, you can put at least a bit of a behavioral uh, assessment together on what to expect and what normally happens in these encounters. And at least it's, it's a glimpse into maybe what they're thinking, uh, at least to a degree. Would you agree with that, Don? Yes. Okay. So I think that these reports are really valuable. And again, you're at the mercy of the, of the integrity of the in- individual because we just don't know. Are they, are they being legitimately honest when they make these reports? Or is it just you know, a bunch of clowns or uh, several clowns out there making you know, false reports and then a, a mixed in with the real ones? So it is possible that you know, not every report is real. And I think that would be the, the proper way to look at it. But... From the reports that are out there and are vetted and investigated, I think we can glean at least some some idea about what these things are and what they what they seem to be is is for the most part not aggressive. They are territorial. They are intimidating, but I think that's that's more of self preservation kind of move. It's yeah, not, yeah. hey, there's something I could eat. Let's go get it. Protected you know? its own. Areas. Right. Yeah, I mean, all of their activities seem to be based around, we don't want those bald ones over here. And by bald, I mean that we don't have hair dragging from our arms and stuff. You know, so we're the bald ones. And, and they, they don't want us. As to the bald winds. We don't want to be yeah. <laughs> They don't want us around. And so they, they behave in such manners to keep us at bay and to, to make us turn back and change course or whatever. That could be for a lot of reasons. It could be because there's a family group nearby possibly some young ones that they were worried about. And so, you know, even some of these really aggressive, uh, you know, displays, I think are just meant to cause people to change course. So they don't go out of their way to hurt people. They do seem very curious. They seem really intrigued with what we're doing and and what we do. Um, You know, I've heard so many reports of them checking out looking in people's windows like what goes on in there you know right and sometimes you know even to the point of you know when people looking out just staring at the people and sometimes mimicking the faces like you know if somebody makes a surprise face suddenly the bigfoot's making a surprise face and it's like wait a minute what's going on here so there does seem to be a genuine curiosity just to see what we're doing um so they do come into our areas they do tend to take whatever they can, but I think that's not, that's not a malicious thing. They're yeah. just thinking, well, there's something I could use and the, the group can use, so I'm going to grab that. And 
when you've when you've scratched a living out of the out of the scrub of the world for a long time, then you know any any buckets of grain and stuff are just going to be gifts. Right. You know, it's like whoa, you know, we got we got food for a couple of days now. So um, I, I don't think they're malicious. I don't mean I don't think they're hurtful. I don't think they go out of their way. I think people have been hurt by them. I do believe that that has happened. Um, you know, and we can only guess to what, as to what might've happened. I think it's possible that some people have disappeared because of them. Right. Uh, and that most likely was very inadvertent that the person stumbled into an area and there was no turning back. And, you know, for whatever reason that, uh, you know, a, a display might've been too, too close and, and with that strength right. and with that size, they could steamroll a person and in, into, you know, oblivion without even flexing, you know? So I think that it may happen, but I don't think for the most part, it's a malicious thing. (laughs) Which, which reminds me of the story Gandalf was telling. No, was it Gandalf? It wasn't Gandalf about them being caught. Maybe it was Bilbo about them being caught by the trolls and almost sat on and squished a jelly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. I think that would be very similar. And, And in fact, I've often thought are the trolls of legend are those, the you know the European version of the of the Bigfoot, the Woodwose, the yeah. Woodywasa, the Gray Man, the and many different names over there for for these beings as well. So, and I think it's possible. But sure. we're going to get into some reports tonight. I don't know. We'll see what we find. Um, again, we'll explore them together. So that's the that's the roster of fun. But if you want to call in, you got something to share, please feel free. Uh, it's great if you can stay, you know, within the subject we're discussing. But if you have something else that you really have to get off your chest, by all means, call in. Because we love hearing from you guys. Absolutely. And uh, if you have any questions in the chat, you don't want to call in, but you got a question, you want to participate in the talk, then by all means, capitalize it at the very least. But uh, the very best is to do the at sign, shift number two, and then, you know, either Paranormal Portal or Aether Archives, and Don and I will see it. So those are some options there. All right. I think we're ready to dive into some Bigfoot reports. What do you think, Don? Sure. All right. That's our cue to jump into it. And and first off, we're going to jump into some BFR roll reports. These are brand, well, pretty new, uh, at least from 2022 or 2021 anyway. And I'm only pulled up a, a few Class A's, and Class A's mean that they saw Bigfoot. They actually witnessed it. Class B is more like hearing uh their their sounds or their calls or finding footprints and i'm not or maybe class c is footprints i don't know anyway i forget the classifications uh on bfro but these are all class a so let's go to those and check it out first one on the roster is uh submitted it was submitted by witness walter morse on monday may 30th 2022 and it may not have happened then but this is a class a it's from 2022, the summer, um, May, which I don't know if that's summer. Is that summer? That'd be sp- spring. That's what I thought, spring. Okay, well, anyway. Summer's almost here. Yeah, but it's New York, so maybe that is summer <laughs> exactly. over in New York. Uh, the, the 30th uh, state was New York, Essex County. Mm-hmm. And uh, the investigator notes this witness cannot precisely pinpoint the spot along the road where the figure was standing, but it is close to the spot, give or take 100 feet. Oh, that's pretty damn. And there's the coordinates. Wow. Yeah. And so the nearest town is Keysville, New York, and it's Augar Lane, uh, Lake Road. And observed 3.20 in the afternoon, which is, I find that so surprising because. Right in the middle of the day. Right. I mean, usually these are nocturnal, but for whatever reason, it was out there by the road. It says, uh, in the in the 3.20 in the afternoon, this date, driving east on Dugway Road in Chesterfield, New York, Essex County, Sunny weather, road was in shady in spots, observed a tall, excuse me, a tall and black Sasquatch standing on the left side of the road next to a large white pine tree, possibly 300 feet ahead of my car. I said to myself, what the hell? And it was gone down the hill. I stopped, got out and searched for prints or maybe catch a smell, but it found nothing, smelled nothing. Clocked the mileage to next road intersection, with the Augur Lake Road to be one plus mile, went back and scoured around a little more, but did not find anything I can report. Also noticed the creature bolted so fast down slope towards the Osable River through heavy woods, sighting only lasted a few seconds. No other witnesses, no other, no other stories not here, 
but have followed the reports of Port Henry, Ticonderoga area some years ago. Um, so it's on a paved road. So here again, this is, uh, it's, this is the kind of report that really puzzles me because could it have hidden and not been seen by this guy? Absolutely. Yeah. And unless he's driving a Tesla, I mean, you can hear a car coming <laughs> a long way away. And I'm sure these things have better hearing than we do by a long shot. So they could hear it even further away. So it could have been hidden and not noticed at all, but it chose to be standing right out in the open. And you got to wonder, what is that about? We've talked about it many times on the show. And of course, the only thing Don and I can consider is what uh, Bear told us, Jim King of the Sasquatch Outlaws or Bigfoot Outlaws. He said, uh, he said that he thinks it's something like counting coup right. for the younger ones. And we don't know a height of this thing. Um, he doesn't really say what, how big it was. He, he just says, says tall black. Yeah, tall and black was all we got to go on. So could it have been a juvenile pulling something like that? Sure, sure. I guess. Yeah. Right. See, maybe we can make them think we're a tree. <laughs> yeah. Stand well, still. I think if they stand still, they are probably hard to, to, to separate from trees. But, you know, right out in the open like that, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to hide that. But anyway, it's a really curious report because... It could have avoided any of this, but it chose to do that right at the time the person was there. And that's, that's intriguing. That's you're kind of, when you look at that, you got to think, what was going on? Why would it do that? And it maybe wanted to shock the person or, you know, perhaps making a statement. Maybe there's, you know, I don't know. There's any, any number of levels of intrigue to a story like that, but it's very interesting. So uh, farm says I've been down the Osceola river on a boat too. beautiful area. Definitely Sasquatch country. Mm. Yeah, I don't doubt it. I mean, there's there's some beautiful areas in upstate New York and in the area. Um, I'm not uh, personally familiar with it, with it at all, but I've seen video from up in there, and it's very rugged. I mean, right outside of, you know, you hear New York and you think of Manhattan. I mean, right. that's just, yeah, that's what we think. Yeah, that's what we think about. But uh, in, in truth, there's a lot of beautiful wildlands in New York State, and uh plenty of areas for there to be something there. So I think it's very interesting. And I think these reports, they give us a window into a behavior. And that's what I'm talking about is that we don't know, we can't study them directly, but when we hear reports like this, you got to think, what are they thinking? What's going on in their head? Why? Because they wouldn't have had to have been seen at all, but chose to be. And that's, what's interesting. So I don't know. I don't have an answer for that, but it is very intriguing. So Let's go to the next one, and uh, this isn't it. <laughs> That's the main page. Here's the next one, and this is uh, another Class A, and this is from May 30th, uh, 20... Wait, is this the same one? Did I pull it up twice? Did yeah, I? Yeah, actually, it's the same one. It's the same one, so they're going to save a little time there. And uh, again, what was he thinking? We don't know. Didn't know any more that time either. Um, this one is from May 17th, 2022, again, Class A. And we can do states if you guys want us to reference some states on the BFRO uh, to talk about any reports in your area. So if you do, uh, put it in capital letters and at Aether Archives so Don can let me know after we get through these BFRO reports. If you want us to check reports in your area or area you're interested in, by all means, let us know. We'll look at it. <clears throat> Again, this is New York. This is Steuben County. Um, and it's 2022 this year, spring in May. Now this person knew that May was spring. There you go. <laughs> wow. So, see, I told you. Yeah. Yeah. You were right. Dang. Steuben County. Um, it doesn't, so there's location details on the north end of El Irwin Mountain State Forest, 1500 feet elevation, GPS coordinates for where witness was sitting on the ground, leaned up against a tree facing west. And again, coordinates. So nearest town is Irwin, New York. Farm, you ever been there? Let us know. Uh, the nearest road was Beartown Road. It said, observed. Town of Irwin, New York State, when I was hunting spring turkeys, mm. I was sitting at the base of a tree location at the top of a ridge line that connected to another ridge. And I was calling gobbler turkeys that were on their roost trees, when at which time the gobblers flew down off the ridge from their roost. I was still sitting at the base of the tree, having not yet moved, Location for a half an hour when I noticed something walking on two legs approximately 75 yards away. The thing was about seven feet tall. I first thought 
Maybe another human was there hunting, but when then it was apparent to me it was dark reddish-brown from head to toe. The, the thing was in my view of sight for about four to five seconds and then went behind a tree, and that was the last I seen it. Then about 15 minutes later, I've not moved from the base of the tree sitting on the ground, same spot, to my left, approximately 30 yards, an object hit a tree mm. about 25 feet up in the tree. Then the object that hit the tree hit the ground and sounded like a rock. I continued through the area for the rest of the morning with no further incidents. Well, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> I think you were going the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> I've hunted in New York uh, for about 42 years and never witnessed something like this before. And he says, I also did notice some musky scents or, or sm of smell order. No other witnesses, no other stories. Approximately 6 a.m., partly cloudy, no wind. Hmm. Uh, top of a uh, ride, ride top, some hemlock, pine, mostly hardwood, oak, and other hardwood trees with a secluded great-sized pond further into the woods. Yep, that would do it. Water. Yeah, always seems to be, yeah, there does seem to be a continuity between water mm -hmm. and these cryptids. Both Dogman and Bigfoot tend to tend to seem to stay close to water. So then there's a bit of a follow-up investigation, including a map down here to kind of give you an idea of where this is all happening. Hey, hey look, it's in the state of New York. It is. <laughs> How weird. <laughs> Which is a strange state indeed. No, I'm just kidding. I, this part of New York I think is fantastic. This part down here I'm not so sure about. <laughs> so very cool. Uh, another great report. And, and you can see just looking at this, this is kind of a satellite image, all the, all the, the green. I mean, you're not seeing huge, right. huge metropolises, even, you know, even Light down pollution. here. Right. I mean, there would be way out in the, in the sticks on this. So very cool reports. Again, that's the second one. And then there's a third one. And this is a uh, class A. And this was from Tuesday, March 1st, 2022. And uh, it's a Class A. 22, oh, this is 2002. Oh, yeah. It was submitted in 2022. Wow. Uh-huh. They, they must have got a bump on the head in April 21st, 20, 2002. <laughs> and then had a memory of it. Right. You know, they had some therapy. Years later. Right. Just came back to them. It's from the state of Wisconsin. And this is Price County. Uh, about five miles east of Park Falls on Highway 182. And the nearest town is Park Falls. Highway 182 is the nearest road. Observed, I was, it was in the early afternoon on a beautiful spring day. I was driving east on Highway 182 about five miles from Park Falls. My friend was in the car and observed uh, it as well. We were headed to a tavern for a bite to eat, excuse me, and a drink. And uh, what time of day was this, does it say? Okay. Early afternoon, <laughs> so it had to be like one or two. Okay, gotcha. Uh, and a drink. And the, the creature ran across the road in three or four long strides and then headed south down a small embankment. There were no houses in the area. What we observed was very tall, broad, and hairy. It was not moving particularly fast and did not appear to be panicked about oncoming traffic. The creature's jog was a graceful glide. It only took about five seconds before it was gone. I even made the comment to my friend that it was a Bigfoot. We pulled over where we saw the creature and exited the car to look for prints, but did not notice anything. There was no trail. Mm. After we arrived at the tavern, we told the regulars what we saw, and no one believed us. <laughs> yeah, you don't usually do that, I don't think. <laughs> it's not a good first impression. Freaking tourists. <laughs> yeah. Other stories, no. It was early afternoon, approximately 1 p.m. on a beautiful spring day. Uh, environment is forest. The creature was seen in an area between a river, forest rapids, and a lake, Blockhouse Lake. So there you go. <laughs> the, the, first, the first paragraph of the follow-up. Oh, what does it say? Uh, I spoke with a witness, Karen Brohaska, by phone. She was down to earth and incredible. Seemed to be a normal Wisconsin a citizen. normal Wisconsin <laughs> citizen. I'm not sure there is such a thing. <laughs> I grew up in Minnesota. We uh, we uh, didn't didn't have a lot of love for the Packer backers. No, I'm just I'm just kidding. I love Wisconsin. Uh, you guys have great cheese. Just saying, it is. It's the best. I mean, 
Gotta love Wisconsin cheese. Um, not that's not the only good thing you got over there. I'm just being an idiot, but but yeah, it, she estimated the creature was seven feet tall and weighed at least seven hundred pounds. Yeah. So you know that's 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 actually a much more accurate than usually. You get almost been four hundred pounds, and it's like eight feet tall. Right. No, probably not. But seven hundred sounds like it might be in the ballpark. Like she might have known exactly what she was talking about. It was muscular and appeared to be very solid. Had long arms. That moved as it was striding. She was not sure if the hair was neat or matted, but it was brown and had long hair, perhaps a foot long. Oof, that is long. Uh, it was far too far away to see facial details. There was no neck visible. It had hands rather than paws, and the area has much food sources and water, as well as many reports and stories from this county in the past. It's funny, the locals still don't buy it, apparently. She was sure it was not a bear, and her account strongly indicates that. She was sure it was not a hoaxer running across the road in a costume because a human is not so large nor runs with such grace. Now, there's a fact. Yeah, that is true. I mean, they, well, I've never seen one run, but by all accounts, it's extraordinarily graceful. It's actually kind of beauteous. So did we get any requests to look up an area? Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, Adams County. Let me see here. Adams County, PA. Adams County, PA. Okay, let's see where we get to the reports here. Uh, PA is Pennsylvania, right? Correct. Let's check out Pennsylvania. Adams County? Adams County. Well, there's oh, six there's out of Adams. Six. Okay, let's see what it says. Um, let's go oh, to the... Class A. Yeah, Class A right on top. In 1961, there's a Class A as well. Let's read the top one first. From 1998. Um, this says, this is 1998... Uh, November 14th, 2001, uh, oh, yeah. was submitted, but 1998 was the year approximately winter, January, unknown date, Pennsylvania, Adams County details, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, along route 116 between Gettysburg and Fairfield. Are you sure it wasn't a ghost? <laughs> it could have been a, a ghost. Uh, the sighting occurred a while ago, so long that I'm not sure of the year, but I would guess January or February of 1998. The reason I am reporting it now is because I was watching the History Channel and the animal they displayed was very similar with a few exceptions. The hair was even all over the body. The History Channel display was baggy at the ankles and narrow at the knees. The eyes were defini definitely very red. The time of the incident was approximately 1 a.m. in the morning. The importance is the animal was mo no more than 150 feet from me. And I stopped the car and the animal and I stared at each other for quite a, a long time until I got tired and left the scene. Wow, I don't know how long that is, but wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. How long does it take to stare at a Bigfoot and get tired? Wow. Could you ever get tired staring at a Bigfoot? Uh, I wouldn't stare at a Bigfoot. It's I mean, usually a challenge. <laughs> my, uh, details. My wife and I were returning home from a friend's home in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, along Route 116 between Gettysburg and Fairfield in front of my headlights. I saw this animal step over a fence and walk across the road west to east. The animal stopped in the middle of the field and look back at the car and I stopped the car to observe. The reason this was not reported sooner is because we did not know how to report the event. And until reading your webpage, I did not realize how prevalent the sightings are. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. That's pretty wild. Um, so it's, I'm sure it must be really hard to follow up, but it's, he suggests it may have been seven or eight feet tall as it easily stepped over a four to five foot fence. Then, well, I mean, that had to have been, Taller than that, if it's a four or five foot fence, because wow. they don't really have they they seem to be more like torso length. So they have shorter legs. Yeah, they seem to have stubbier legs in in comparison to the whole body height. Ah. But um, but anyway, across the road and only he two or three steps. Legs. Yeah, <laughs> two or three steps. He felt the color was dark brown or black, and the hair was not overly long. The female witness, however, remembered the hair color as reddish, and she felt that the hair was length was longish and neither could come up with an exactly how long they sat and stared at the creature. The man also stated that it was very peculiar how the eyes were a very visible red, even when the car headlights were not shining into them and the creature was standing in the field. All right. So there you go. That's from uh, Pennsylvania. Any other requests? Yeah, we got one from Will Wilmer. Oh, what does Will want? He wants... Guess what? It's Stevens County, Washington. <laughs> yeah, he's got a he does research up there in Sasquatch Alley, as he calls it. That's, That's true. Uh, yeah. He's got a lot of uh, strangeness up there, of which he says he will uh, bring the portal along 
for an investigation. Yeah, we <clears throat> rolling along. Well, you know, it's, I don't always require uh, Stevens County too much accommodations. No, <laughs> just I, I don't. I don't. Uh, Did anybody bring some water? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Hey, will you? By the way, where'd Will go? Yeah. I can't see him. <laughs> Uh, let's see. We got uh, Washington is right there. Let's see what Stevens County has. Stevens County, 17 reports on the BFRO. And uh, of them, Class A, October 2021, right there away. Nighttime motorist sighting. Again, a lot of cars. See, that's why I say the next Patterson-Gimlin film is going to come from a dash cam. Right. These are just the most of the sightings people have. It's incredible. So if you got a little extra money, get a dash cam, go drive in some forest areas. There you go. You, you very well could become uh, the next uh, Bob Gimlin. And uh, I don't know if that's a, a wonderful thing because I know Bob it, it had to take a lot on the chin to come forward and right. stand up for that, uh, for that film. But, yeah, incredible. So this is 2021 is the year. Actually, a very new report from the fall, October 22nd from Washington, Stevens County. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, Highway 231 and Sanctuary Way intersection, Google Maps pin, copy and paste into the browser, and you can see where exactly. It's from Springdale, Washington. Springdale. Highway 231 observed. Friday, October 22nd, 9.40 p.m., I just left our local school home homecoming football game in Springdale, Washington, with two of my children and a friend of theirs, two high school f- freshmen and a mid- mid-schooler, we're driving south on Highway 231, and as we approached the Sanctuary Way, and there's the coordinates, just off the highway in the ditch, I noticed a very large black thing in, in the tall yellow uncut grass. I initially thought it may be a black wolf, so I slowed down and stared at it as we approached, and by the time we drove to it, we were traveling about 35 to 40 miles per hour. As we reached it, I was in shock and amazement as... It was an ape-like figure hunched down in the ditch staring right at me. From the crouch position, he or she took two steps away from the road, and it was almost as it it was slow motion as it felt our eyes were locked and its head was on a swivel as we rolled by. I wished I would have slammed on the brakes, but we had two cars behind us, and I was literally shocked. We turned at the first turnout available, 60 yards up the road, uh, let the cars go by and returned to the location, but did not see or hear anything at all. I'm still perplexed at this sighting as I clearly seen everything from face, head, arms, legs, etc. They were all very well defined and covered with short hair fur, with the exception of the lower forehead, eyes, and nose. There were four other witnesses, and I've, I've heard of One incident in the vicinity occurring two months prior, other than that, just stories from grandparents of sightings by them decades ago. And it was about 9.40 p.m. overcast, slight sprinkles. It had been raining most of the afternoon and evening. Uh, Mix some farmland, trees, and small mountains. Hmm. Wow. There you go. Yeah, Stevens County is no joke, folks. There's a lot of activity going on up there. As, you know, I mean, the BFRO is a great site. But there's a lot of reports are never, ever filed. But someone like Will uh, gets to know people and starts to hear the stories from the locals. And, uh, I mean, it really comes to life how much is going on and how often people actually see these things. Just these reports are are not as, as common as you think. I think they're getting more common, though. More people are coming forward to share their experiences and put it out there. But, yeah, I think so. Any other uh, requests? Um, yes, uh, Indiana. Indiana. We named the dog Indiana. We named the dog Indiana. <laughs> All right, let's see what's going on in Indiana. Oh, and somebody also wanted Toledo, Ohio. Like oh. nothing weird ever happens in Ohio, right? <laughs> nothing weird, nothing ever. No. All right. Was there a specific county in Indiana? No, I didn't see one. Okay. Well, let's just uh, find the county with the most stuff going on. Looks like eight reports in Monroe. Um, that might be the best one. Eight, eight. Yeah, it looks like. Yeah, it looks like Monroe County is going to have the most uh, claims. So let's take a look at that. Um, let's see a Class A. October 1989 or 90, two sisters observed creature cross the road. I'm telling you, the road is the key. Yeah. The road is the key for these things. It's also the joke. It's also the what? The joke. The joke? 
Why oh. did the Bigfoot cross the road? Oh. <laughs> to get on the BFRO. <laughs> <laughs> That's the punchline, ladies and gentlemen. Not a very good one, but it's the only one I could come up with. Uh, this one comes from Monroe County, uh, 1989 or 90. It's in the fall. Uh, it was actually filed in 2000 on the BFRO. Month of October. Uh, Unionville is the nearest town, Lakeshore Drive, question mark, and observed. In southern Indiana, Unionville, October 1990 or 89, my sister and I were on our way home late at night, approximately 2 a.m., when a Bigfoot walked in front of my sister's Honda, touching the front of the vehicle. I bet. I was like, <laughs> I'm not scared of this was tiny it a, thing. Was it a touch or was it, hey, 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 you know, <laughs> yeah, trying yeah. to get out of the way. It was very hairy and had long arms. It walked upright, but this creature had a sideways gait as though uh, limping or injured. Well, you just punched it in the leg with the Honda. Yeah. yeah, Turns out running Hondas into him isn't a good thing. (laughs) It looked straight at us and walked slowly. It did not appear to be afraid. It was approximately five feet four, I'd say. It closely resembled an orangutan. Must have been a young one. Time and conditions, it was dark, but the creature was within feet of us. It was cool out but i don't recall rain huh uh the follow-up i spoke with the phone with the primary witness and then later to her sister and although in the report the witness stated that it looked like an orangutan when i uh directed her to a website with pictures of orangs she stated that it didn't really look like that (laughs) her sister stated that she was in such a state of shock when it occurred that she really didn't get a good look at the face and her estimate is of its height was four and a half to five feet. Huh. The witness said the hair was orangish brown, while her sister called it orangish red. Well, I mean they're in the same ballpark, right? Potato, oh, yeah. potato, patata. At that right. point, um, you know, I I don't know. I I I imagine that we often talk about the possibility of a real biodiversity. Not every Bigfoot's going to be nine, ten, eleven, twelve feet tall, as you know are right. commonly claimed. Maybe they have little people too. You know, I mean honestly. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a trait that occurs in all of nature, just like albinoism and melanism, um, (coughs) you know, certainly varying heights and perhaps birth defects is what caused this weird gate. Or maybe this is somehow an orphan. Right. Or yeah, it could be an orphan. Uh, (coughs) it might've been injured and lost its family. Who knows? I mean, any number of things. and, And again, we don't know, we don't know much of anything, but, I think through these reports, you can put together a behavioral uh, model, at least. They like to see cars going by. Right. Maybe that's part of the curiosity for them. Maybe that's the akin, <coughs> that's akin to looking in the living room window for them. They just watch the cars go by like, wow, there's people in that one too. You know, I, I don't know. Well, my, you know, my dog sits at the top of my hill looking down at the road, watches the cars go by all the time. Sure. I mean, know, so why, why can't the Bigfoot one well, do that? People you know? do sit around and watch cars go <laughs> by. Out there with Some of the best real estate is on top of buildings where you see the highways. <laughs> that's you know? true. So maybe it's not that unusual. All right. Yeah. I think it's interesting, though. Uh, but again, the number of sightings in this manner is just crazy. So that's from Indiana. Now you said where in Ohio? Toledo. Toledo. What county is that in? Because they don't list no it by idea. cities. Let's um, see. Um, Ohio. Toledo. Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Rhode Island, South Carolina. County. All right. Just that old 50 nifty United it States. Is Lucas so. County. Lucas County. Let's see what's going on in Lucas County. If anything, you know, there's plenty of counties that don't have any claims, but uh, Lucas has none. Wow. That might be because it's the county seat. Yeah. And there's a, there's a big city there maybe. Um, but I don't know what's close to that. Any, any idea? Um, uh, da, 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 Lake Erie. What's about? I guess we can go to Ashland. They've got nine reports out of Ashland. There's got to be an A in there. Uh, most recent reports, 2021. So that's got a good chance of being uh, decent. Let's go to Ashland and see what it is. Class A, April 2021, last there you year. Go. Um, recounter, uh, recent encounter behind warehouse 24 gym on the outskirts of Ashland. All right, let's check it out. The year is 2021. The season is the spring month is April 24th to be precise. The state Ohio in Ashland County. Investigator notes the Sasquatch was spotted at the edge of a tree line behind the out- outskirts of Ashland. Uh, and again, gives the latitude and longitude, uh, to oh, click this uh, Bing Maps, yeah, whatever. Ashland, nearest road is uh, s- uh, State, state, r- route, state Route 250. Okay. 
Observe, my 20-year-old stepdaughter had a visual sighting last night in Ashland, Ohio. The date was, what the hell's going on? Why can't I see it? <laughs> right? That's weird. Yeah, it's, it's kind let me, of, let um, me stretch change this. Your, well, no, change your, change your Zoom. Let's just do this. Boom. I'll make it full. It didn't work. Oh, change the Zoom? Change the okay, zoom. I'll have to Zoom out a little. Oh, it's yeah, at 200%. Oh, there you go. There we go. All right, Yay. so uh, the date was 42421. It was about midnight, and she had left a 24-hour gym that has woods behind it. She saw a gray, over-seven-foot creature after hearing a twig snap. She stated it was way too large to be a human, and it moved way too fast to be a human. She called us from the local Bob Evans parking lot in tears, asking for us to come drive her home because she was so shook up. It was a terrifying experience for her. I went and inspected the area briefly the next day, and I found many old clear or deer tracks, rather, but no imprints of the creature she saw. I'm not a hunter or a tracker and only spend about 10 minutes in the area. She is one person I would consider an extremely reliable witness. She is a very responsible college student that is very moral and truthful. She does not drink or take drugs. Wow. So, I mean, it's surprising. Again, is that the curiosity? Like, what are those people doing there? Is it outside of a gym? So maybe there's windows and they can kind of see what people are doing. Yeah, no lifting doubt. stuff and running in one place with, you know, like magic. Why do they do that <clears> in a <throat> room all by themselves? <laughs> know, right. Yeah, you got to wonder. Um, but that's uh, crazy. That was Ohio. Oh, Ohio. Ohio. All right. Any other requests? Hey, get this one. What? Wonder Woman wants East Texas. What is a uh, county? Tyler Give or Walker County. Go okay. figure that one out. Tyler or Walker County. I bet you we're going to walk and run into a place called the Big Thicket somewhere around there. That's about right. Okay, Texas. All right. Um, Tyler or Walker. Getting there. It's a big state. Lots of counties. Holy man, there's a lot of counties. Uh, Tyler has two. Walker has five. Huh. Uh, which one would we prefer? Let's shoot for the five, see if they got any class A's. Uh, January 2005, Class A. There's actually three, four Class A's and they're in their uh, claims. So let's see what it is. All right, the year is 2005. Season is winter, the month of January, date of the 9th, the state of Texas. Walker County, to be exact, uh, near Lake Con Conroe. Several creeks in the area that we were scouting around. There is your water, Don. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Nearest town is New Waverly. And this is, the nearest road is FM, FM 1375. And observed, Mike Hall and I just wrapped up a night operations with TBRC BFRO. On that Saturday night, we hiked out of the area and met with Daryl Coiler, or Collier, Alton Higgins, and other members of the group at the Forest Service Road, where we had parked Mike's Jeep. We loaded our gear in the back and headed back to base camp as others left to go back into the woods to do some further research. Interested in getting back to base camp and getting warm and much needed sleep, I was concentrating on watching, t watching four animals in the roadway as I didn't want us to hit something and be stuck out there in the cold. Mike was driving and there was no conversation until we topped a hill in the road and I saw something moving in the same direction that we were in the middle of the road. I pointed and asked, what's that? Well, Mike slowed and asked, what is that? And I answered, that thing in the road just beyond the headlights. Mike looked and said, holy smokes. I don't know. That's probably not what he said. But. And I said, whatever it is, don't hit it. And we saw, what we saw was a large, dark, upright, moving creature walk in the middle of the road. It was about five and a half to six feet tall, moving upright in the same direction that we were traveling. It had noticeable hair on its head and seemed domed and no neck, as if its head was resting right on its shoulders. It was very, very broad at the shoulders and thick, massive. It never turned to look at us, so I don't know what the face looked like, and we have no recollection of its hands or lower body. Our focus was on how wide it was and how smooth that it moved. It was amazing, just very graceful. No jerky motions, no, very fluid in the movement. As we neared, it moved to the side of the road in a smooth motion, then stepped off into the ditch and into the woods to the right side of the road. Then Mike, realizing what we were witnessing, stopped the Jeep, 
grabbed the gun and flashlight and jumped out to look for tracks. I stayed in the Jeep, not believing what I was seeing with it running. As Mike scanned the woods following the sounds he was hearing, he motioned for me to cut the engine and waved for me to get out and join him. I did both reluctantly. As I got near Mike, he asked for me to look where he was shining his flashlight and to tell him what I saw. To my utter disbelief, I saw a large shape of head and shoulders move quickly between two trees and disappear. It must, I must have blinked because it was just there one second and gone the next. We scanned the woods and the road for any signs but couldn't see anything. We also listened for movement, but it was dead quiet. We then moved back to, to the into the Jeep and just sat there, amazed by what we had witnessed. There was no order, no sound, other than what Mike had heard before I got out of the Jeep. In reflection on the event, I did have the feeling that we were being watched. Mike was so excited over this, he could hardly think, so I grabbed a pad and pen and said to him, here, let's write down what we saw. He was so shaken, he couldn't even write. So I took over and had him dictate what he saw and added to what I saw. Not, not having any way to communicate with the others in the woods, we didn't know what to do. Not thinking clearly because of the excitement and lack of sleep, we drove back to base camp when we were headed to the first, where we were heading in the first place. Upon reaching camp, I just couldn't face another cold night on the ground and begged Mike to take me into town to a nice warm hotel. I don't think he might have been, <laughs> might not have been so much about the cold, but uh, <laughs> feeling a little unnerved maybe. Yeah, no doubt. The next day we returned and reported the incident to Daryl Collier and the rest of the group. Also noticed the next day after leading the group back to the spot in the road, there were several impressions found in the ditch and in the woods next to, next to the road. Other witnesses might call on me. So that's a pretty powerful right. uh, a documented case by BFRO itself. So well, there you go. These guys were out there researching. So Tommy Cooper from Cryptovania. Hey. How you doing, buddy? Um, let's see. Uh, he says uh, Crawford County, PA, which is south of Erie. Crawford County, Pennsylvania. PA is Pennsylvania. Let me close some of these tabs here. Uh, all right. We'll, we'll close on this one because there is more that I want to do. Man, Pennsylvania's got 122. Well, yeah. There's just a few there. <laughs> so it's uh, Crawford. Crawford County. All right. Crawford County, there's two reports there. Hmm. Let's check it out. There are two reports. It's one of them's Class A. From September 1976. Wow. wow young was... young explorer gets stalked by Bigfoot. It Oof. wasn't me. I was only five at the time. I'd be a young explorer, but <laughs> not that. Oh, man. Not around there. Nope. Uh, 1976, fall, September 18th, Pennsylvania, Crawford County. This occurred four miles outside of Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania, and Crawford County, off of Route 408. Observed, the date was September 18th, 1976, and I remember it well because it was my eighth birthday and I just received a pellet gun <laughs> oh as a present. I decided to take the pellet gun and go exploring up the dirt road that ran in front of our family's house. I'd walked up around a corner about a mile from home when I came to the entrance of an old logging trail. Mm. A thickly wooded area was to my right and a large cornfield to the left. I'd spent, a couple of rounds, uh, I'd spent a couple of rounds out of my pellet gun on various objects when I got an innate sense of being watched. As I looked into the wooded area approximately 50 yards deep, I saw a Bigfoot looking at me. Wow, eight years old? Poor kid. I estimate the height to be around eight feet, very dark in color, covered in fur, and very curious as to what I was doing. My first instinct was to run, but I did not want to involve, uh, invoke a chase, yes. so yeah. I slowly turned and started walking towards home. After starting to move through my peripheral vision, I could see the Bigfoot moving with me at around the same speed. Just to make sure I was actually seeing this, I stopped. The Bigfoot stopped. Mm. I took several steps and stopped again. The Bigfoot took several steps and stopped as I did, maintaining a perfectly parallel course to the one I was on. Wow. At this point, fear became my motivator. I dropped my <laughs> gun and ran. When I got home, I told both my brothers what I saw, and they accompanied me back to the spot with rifles. We were unable to spot the Bigfoot again, but this sighting will forever be etched in my memory. Yeah, yeah. no doubt. That's the kind of thing you'll never unsee. Yeah. No doubt. Wowzers. Well, there you go. 
Pennsylvania doesn't disappoint, folks. Wow, that's a that's an oldie but a goodie. Okay, so I want to get to some uh, some reports from Sasquatch Chronicles. Some oh boy. submissions. Oh boy. Yeah, you know it. Yeah. That's where all the good stuff happens. Mister Germer. <laughs> Mister Wes, of course. Um, these are a couple of reports that were submitted by readers, and again through the through the last series of reports, be in a car. <laughs> with a camera. Be in a car with a dash cam. It's a dash cam. You're going to catch something amazing eventually, or at least with the more people doing it. I, I think those videos are going to start coming in anytime because dash cams are getting so much more prevalent. But roadside road sightings are so mo- really, really common. I would say that they are equally as common as any other type of sighting, if not more so. Why they do it, I don't know, but they do. Right. So... Let's check out this from Sasquatch Chronicles blog. This was from June 15th today. No human could do that. Spoke to the witness and she is still upset about what she saw and what happened to her that night. She writes, I had a sighting back in the mid 90s. It was August of 1996 to be exact. And I would have been about 18 at the time. My friend and I were driving down a back road to kill some time before she took me home. The road was a cut through dirt road that made a loop back out to the main highway. The road was about three miles long and was basically for a farmer to get back to the field to feed his cows. Funny part to that story is my boyfriend at the time told me that he's seen a Bigfoot on that road one night and I laughed at him. (laughs) Be careful what you laugh at. That's karma right there. Uh, So so as we turned on the dirt road, which my friend was driving, it was uh, 89 Nissan Sentra. Kind of small and boxy, and I told my friend that my boyfriend had seen a Bigfoot squatting down and swaying in in true Bigfoot style. I didn't know that at the time, but right after he turned on his onto this road, the other night, uh, right after he turned on this road the other night, she laughed, and so did I, and called him crazy. Now here's where it gets weird. We ride for about a mile and pull over where we're going to hang out and smoke and do what teenagers do. My friend screams, "Don't look out your window!" It was, at, it was that time right before dark. You can still see, but it's getting dark. Of course, I turned my head and all I could see was wet, dark fur rubbing up against my window and I could see skin that was gray and leathery. Mm. I say three seconds later, it starts beating the roof of the car all the while with its fur rubbing up and down and smearing itself all over the window. I screamed at my friend, go, drive. She throws the car in first, and we fly out of there. We, we were scared to death. And by the time we got back into the main road, we got to the nearest service station that had an outdoor security light, and we looked at the dents in the roof of the car and muck and mud. The car smelled like a skunk. There were four large dents in the roof of that car. This was real. This really happened, and I thought after seeing the dents in the car, No human could do that. Back then, no cell phone. We were in shock. My friend took me back to her house with her that night to try to explain to her parents what happened to her car. They never believed us. They thought we went to a party and someone drunk was jumping on the roof or something. Of course, I told my mom and she never never didn't believe me, but she never fully did either. Which, when I was younger, uh, my my grandfather and I used to sane minnows from a creek that was located off that road and we always used to tell me to stay close to him or the whoosh the whoosh woolly whoosh woody would get me heck he would tell me that at his house as well not to mention i grew up about five miles from where i had my encounter and my grandfather lived across the street from me Mm. going back looking over the years knowing what i know now we totally had activity on our property from the screams to markings and structures. And for the longest, I thought my mom's no good boyfriend was just making this stuff up in order to, to just get to stay. He wasn't the best person. And we had 250 acres we grew up on. And I remember hearing some of the craziest things in the woods and also that feeling of being watched. Wow. You know, if she just could have rolled down the window and grabbed some fur. All right. You know, it's like, excuse me while I take a sample. <laughs> That's got to be terrifying. I, I don't know. I mean, this happened to some teenagers, but just think, being an adult, I, I, don't, I don't think I would have reacted any, either, any better. I mean, right. to be just like, get out of here, let's go. <laughs> oh, man. How, how heavy is your foot? 
Yeah. Oh, it's going to get heavier. Hold on. Yeah, it's like I'd be Flintstoning out of the bottom of that one. Just like right. two legs poke out and I'm I'm kicking. Pieces. <laughs> that's crazy. That's a, that's an insane report. Very wild. No doubt. You don't you don't forget things like that. Now, why did it do it? Well, territorial display, I guess, because it doesn't sound like that thing went far from there. Maybe it was a really old one. Do you think when they get older, Don, that they might have less less of a range and they just stick to a spot? You know, I yeah, that could that'd be. I mean, because I like staying in one spot. <laughs> I'm done moving around these. Places. <laughs> no, it's like a, I moved around all my life. I'm sitting here. I'm done. Yeah, it's like the equivalent of the front porch in a rocking chair, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. The Bigfoot's like, this is where it is. This is retirement. No more scrubbing across the countryside. No, I, I think that there's there's powerful truths to that. But what a great report. Um, I, I don't know. I don't envy her having seen that. But I'll bet you she apologized to her boyfriend. I bet. <laughs> I bet. You know, Billy, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. But uh, it's weird that two people could go to the same spot at different times and both have an encounter. You know that thing was sticking around there, which I think is not real common. Okay, let's go to the next one. And this is also from uh, Sasquatch Chronicles. This one's a shorter one. And it's from June 13th, The Scream I Could Not Place. Mm -hmm. A listener writes, My experience is not as dramatic as those I hear on your podcast, but to me... It was just as real and life-changing. I, like others, have always been interested in the topic, but never thought I would have any sort of encounter myself. It was almost seven years ago now, and I was dr dropping off a trailer at my father-in-law's property on Erdman Road in Bear Lake, Manistee County, Michigan, on his 80-acre plot in the woods he calls the farm. I just unhooked the trailer and pushed it back about 40 feet from my wife's Honda Pilot, when I heard the loudest, most guttural scream slash roar mm -hmm. I've ever heard, I could tell it was about a half to a mile away from to the northwest of me, and it lasted for probably 45 to 60 seconds in total. This started low and built up in volume to a crescendo that rattled me to my very core. I grew up hunting, fishing, running a trap line, and spending every possible minute in the outdoors in the countryside of uh, Fountain in Mason County, and I know what every sound every animal known to exist in Michigan makes. This was no fox, coyote, owl, dog, bear, or bobcat. This thing had huge lungs to be able to make the kind of sound that I heard. Uh, I listened, not believing what I was hearing, and then when the sound got to the end of a, a decrescendo, I don't know if that's what, that's what he's spelling, right? Descrescendo, okay. I lost my composure and ran back to my wife and the, the waiting vehicle where I started to tear up while trying to explain to her what had happened. She states that I was ash white with tears in my eyes in complete panic, and she knew something had happened. Yeah. So here's, here's the thing that I think about those. Now, it's an auditory phenomena, but the the I guess it's the intensity of those screams that is so right. impactful that it just makes people terrified. Well, you know, you gotta you gotta wonder: is there infrasound in in, right. in that? Sure, I'm sure I'm sure there are. But yeah, yeah, I mean, because if you heard like a loud crash or something, don't oh, you yeah. be like, well, let's go check it out. Even if it's really loud, it's right. like, whoa, what the hell's going on? Right. You don't feel this instinct of fear, but it must be the the sustained and the power of the notes right. that goes on for so long. And it's like, you, th you, I mean, you must be thinking Godzilla at that point, right? <laughs> right. Like something that guy's huge. Got some big lungs. Right. I mean, is that what it is? Is it just because by the sound of it, you're thinking something enormous is out there right. and it's roaring? It's not happy, so maybe that's the fear in it, or is it a is it a is it almost telepathic in that way? Like I'm gonna really freak you out now, and uh, it, it 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 appeals. Maybe it's a bio like a maybe it's like a genetic memory. Mm. Who knows? I don't know. You know, there's things to that. Like the the t the term genetic memory is a very real thing. Like there's some things we just know on a, on a like a an intuitive genetic level maybe right. and maybe that sound is a really really bad sound from our yeah. ancestors right who dealt with these things regularly scratching property out of the wild you know right um territories and stuff battling over territories but 
whatever the case, man, it's like so many people hear those noises. And I got to tell you that I've heard, I've heard several recorded noises, we, you know, putting on headphones and cranking up the volume. Right. It's intimidating as hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, man, I don't want to know what made that noise. That's kind of like the, uh, the the demon in the basement sound. <laughs> right, that was oh, that's horrible. Ooh. Yeah, I'd be, I you know, I I pride myself on on my uh, stoicness and spiritual stuff, but if I heard that scream that that maybe you've heard it on the show before, I still got it in my files. If you want to dig it up, I will. But it's about the most horrid it's sound disturbing. of a demon scream that you'll ever hear. Terrible, terrible sound, and it's got a really twisted. Uh, twisted backstory not really but it's just an investigative story but yeah it's very very strange so um this is crazy just a roar but that guy was like nope uh i'm all done so let's go to the next one here and you know if we get enough time we can go back to the bfro stuff so if any of you any of the rest of you that we didn't get to had uh um, locations to look up we can do that but we'll do it at the tail end of the show because I want to move through these. Now, this is from Sasquatch Chronicles again, and special thanks to Wes for letting us use this. And uh, I just want to point out, because I know people know Sasquatch Chronicles. I mean, it's the you know the premier podcast out there for Bigfoot and, and weirdness. And, uh, and obviously he does a phenomenal job, but most people, I, I don't know if most people are utilizing the website, sasquatchchronicles.com, because... Right. There's so much stuff on there that either is highlighting other shows, like he features our shows over there sometimes, which is awesome, but several other people's shows. And it's a great repository for these kind of stories from listeners that write in, and maybe they won't ever make it on the show just for whatever number of reasons, but uh, you know, I'm sure Wes gets more emails than he can possibly get through. Yeah, no doubt. But you know, they are still fantastic stories, and uh, there's a lot of information over there. To glean, you know, again, I guess the theme for tonight is that we don't have them in our garage to study, but we do have these reports. And I think the information in, in what we can glean from these reports is so valuable. Right. Because it gives us a glimpse at, at some behavioral, uh, ex, ex, you know, experiences. So you can see what people experienced and try to understand the behavior. And it can give you at least a rudimentary kind of out overview of what maybe is going on in the head of these Bigfoot. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. At least you can ask some of the questions and, and maybe through dialogue come up with some conclusions. But this one's from June 15th, the Chewy River, um, the Chewy Road encounter, rather. And it starts out, I hope I can explain well enough in this email what happened on the corner of Chewy Road in Adair County, Oklahoma. I'll be speaking on behalf of mine and my family's encounters together in this email, and if you'd like to know more, my mom and my aunt are ready to share as well as myself. Let me start with our family home where we experienced these things was an old Indian burial ground. It says burial ground, but I think he means burial ground, which we always knew about living there. It had, it had always had an odd feel to it, living there, but we learned to live with it. We experienced... Constant orbs, shadows, whispers, and more. And I remember playing in my room at night with no curtains on my window and having an overwhelming sense of fear that was so bad. I would bolt out of my room to a part of the house that didn't have windows. I understand why uh, I had these feelings at the time, but I remember, I never understood why I had these feelings at the time, but I remember having the urgency to get out of my room, a feeling of being watched. My family was always used to those things, the paranormal, but it was the flesh and blood encounters that terrified us. My first encounter in my mother's second happened when I was 11 years old. We were walking from my grandma's house back to mine, which took us maybe three or four minutes. It was very late and pitch black before we walked out my grandma's door. I felt the overwhelming fear again, which I blew off. I hated walking in the dark there. We walked out of the house with our two cats walking beside us. It was so quiet outside you could hear a, a pen drop. We started walking up the hill and about four feet in front of us was a tree full of birds. The birds in the trees started going crazy and they flew quickly out of the tree, which startled us. After the birds started flying off, my cats that were practically walking under our feet also took off and as soon as my cats bolted, we heard what I can only explain as a huge lion. The growl slash roar was so deep, we could, only, we could physically feel it in our bodies 
and it continued to get louder. My mother looked at me and told me not to run. Even though I wanted to run for my life, I trusted her and quickly walked beside her. When we got to our yard where my papa previously hooked up a floodlight just one month before this encounter, I took a deep breath and felt relieved when we got under that floodlight in our own yard. I don't know why I felt uh, out, out of danger in the light, but I'm assuming because I could finally see around me. My mother grabbed my hand and ran me into the house at that time. I was so scared, I started to cry and begged my dad to come home from work. I never shook that feeling of fear. It wasn't until two years ago that my mother shared her own personal encounter with me. Hers happened one year before my own encounter when I was 10 years old. She was with a co-worker getting a ride home from work, and as they turned into our driveway, her and the co-worker seen what she could only tell me was something right out of the movies. She said it was a real living werewolf. Whoops. Oof. Her description of it was around six feet tall, black hair, giant head, small waist with ears, and a snout. And she kept telling me it was a Bigfoot, but I'm not really sure. Small waist with ears. Those are weird places to put ears. (laughs) I can't seem to find any Bigfoot descriptions like that, but I could be wrong. I'm still learning. And anyways, her and that coworker were so frightened that they locked... They looked at each other, and neither of them said a word. The Bigfoot ran across the street on two legs into the woods. My mom didn't want to get out of the car, but when she finally did, she bolted into the house and never said a word. So when me and my mom had our encounter together that next year, she knew exactly what it was that roared at us, and that's why we also got floodlights in the same year. I'm glad she didn't tell me what she saw when I was a child, but as an adult... I'm just as scared. When she shared her own encounter with me, she also explained to me that the night it roared at us, she knew it was behind the house, which was directly behind us. That's why she told me not to run that night. She knew that what it was, and she knew where it was standing, and I think that scares me the most. The paranormal encounters in our home didn't give me the fear like whatever that flesh and blood thing did was, but I'm scared of the dark as an adult because of it. I always keep my curtains closed at night, and I haven't had that feeling of being watched since moving away from there, but this is mine and my mom's encounters. Now I will share my aunt's own encounter on behalf of her for this email. Hers is a short but very scary. She's extremely traumatized still. This happened in the early 2000s. She had picked up her grandson, and was sleeping. uh, he was sleeping in the back seat while, while... She was taking a back road home. It's just was taking, but I think she was taking a back road home. She was driving quickly and was coming around the corner when she noticed something giant and hairy on the side of the road. She thought it was a man until getting closer. As she finally had driven right up to it, by which this time she said it was, it was standing in the middle of the road. She slammed her brakes on not to hit it, and when she realized how giant this thing was, She was in complete fear. She quickly realized it was not a human, but something else. As her car stopped directly in front of it, the Bigfoot slammed both of its hands on the hood of her car while making noises. She was in complete shock and was so scared, she actually reversed the whole way off back off the road. She never spoke about it for years after that and never drove that road ever again. She said it was an animal, brown, long hair, very large, very scary face, huge, and it looked like a giant ape. I can get better descriptions from my mom and aunt if you're interested. I'm not a very good writer. I hope I explained well enough. And also, if you ever want to know of places that are full of encounters of all sorts, look into Adair County, Stillwell, Oklahoma. Mm. It's where I live still with my husband and children, just in town now. We are Cherokee, and the people around here all have stories and encounters for days. Weird things happen here in Adair County, Oklahoma. Unexplainable things also look into Beaver Gap. That's one place that the people that live here refuse to go. Although it's down the road from my town, my family will not go near it. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. Again, cars and roads, man. What is it? 
What is it? Yeah. But it's it's a common thread. It's a really common thread in these stories. Not sure what's going on with these reports or with these uh, with these encounters, but man, it's it's so common. These these stories are so common. I did want to hit this one too, and I don't know if this is cryptid related or not. This was just an interesting story. I thought about c- trying to cover it on the news, but uh, it's a I guess it's a wonderful story in that this was a missing three year old spends two nights lost in remote Montana. And this is from the beginning of June here in uh, uh, this year. So I wanted to read this with you guys because, uh, you know, maybe, I mean, this is a three-year-old. So if, you know, much like that other little kid that was lost and said he spent two days with a bear that took care of him, right. um, they, they probably don't have the verbal ability right. to say, I mean, it's big and hairy. It must be a bear, right? Because that's a kid, a, a little toddler. They don't know. And so yeah, that's a beautiful story of a kid that made it home. This kid made it home, but I'm not sure what the details here are. But let me blow it up a little bit, first of all, because it's tiny. And uh, tiny is not fun to read. It says, authorities of Montana's Lincoln County Sheriff's Office are happy to report that a missing three-year-old boy has been found after spending two nights lost in a remote area of northwest Montana. The child, named Riker, was last seen on Friday, June 3rd, playing with his family dog outside the home. The home is located south of the small town of Troy. Oh, that's right, down the road. Yeah, and on the east side of Bull Lake. Uh, It said, by the time a concerned neighbor reported Riker uh, as a possible missing child, it was determined that he'd already been missing for more than two hours. Ground teams, dogs, drones were deployed to search for Riker, but... Poor weather conditions forced a helicopter response to turn back. Riker wouldn't be found in this first day of the search, set to remain missing throughout the night. The following day, helicopters and drones were able to respond, along with more canine and ground crews. Poor weather conditions continued to complicate the search amid rainy, low-visibility conditions with low ceiling. Dense vegeta- vegetation and was also problematic, limiting visibility and adding another obstacle in the r- rugged terrain. Riker would spend another night missing. Oh, man, that's got to be a heartbreaker. On the third day of the search, June 5th, 53 personnel were combing through the area when it was reported that a child was found. Deputies responded to Pine Ridge Road off of South Fork, Bull River, uh, finding that the child was Riker, who was in good spirits and apparently healthy, although hungry, thirsty, and cold. Riker was transported via ambulance to a local medical center for evaluation. An initial description of Riker's last known clothing proved to be inaccurate. Other details about the discovery were not included in Lincoln County Sheriff Office's press release on the matter. It's worth noting that Pine Ridge Road, roughly where Riker was found, provides a relatively direct connection to Bull Lake. Uh, update a, a later report from today.com would indicate that Riker was found in an old log cabin oh. style shed by a family checking on their cabin. Authorities stated they were looking into how Riker was able to go missing. Read more about the discov- discovery here. The location Riker was found appears to be about one in th- to three miles from where he was last seen based on the distance measured from Google maps. The map below shows a rough estimate of where Riker went missing and where he was found. Although exact details weren't released, the map is also being included to show the rugged nature of the terrain. Wow. Um, It looks like this is the area. Was missing from here and found down here. Right. Uh, Details of how Riker survived the situation that would have put him up against dangerous weather conditions and wildlife have not emerged. Bears and big cats would have been at present in this part of the country. More details may come out in upcoming days. A long list of groups that were involved in the search for Riker, a message of gratitude from the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office, shows the scale of the public involvement in the search. It's interesting because he was found in a cabin, though. Right. That's very strange. Did they leave it unlocked? Well, it, what kind of condition was it in? Was it like the uh, one we were in in Coloma? Oh, jeez. You know? I mean, yeah, I mean, if that's the case, the door wouldn't even shut. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, not that I'd want to be shutting that place alone. We have a caller. We have a caller. Let's get to our caller and find out what's going on. And uh, let's see what's going on here. All right, this is area code 240. You're on the air. 
Hey, how you doing, man? Hey, brother. Um, who are we talking to? Oh, you can hear me clearly? Yeah, I can hear you okay. It's a little soft, but it's okay. Okay, uh, actually, uh, this is High Tide. <laughs> Hi, Tide. Hi, Tide. How are you? Welcome, brother. Good to talk to you. What's on your mind tonight? So, um, I'm from the Southern Maryland area, and I figured, I, I thought I would share a few things with you guys. Um, I, I don't really know what story to give you, so I don't know how much time you're going to give me, but I'll try to make it quick and give you a couple. Sure. Um, when I was younger, I think I was about five or seven years old. Okay. My father told me a story about uh, him laying in bed next to my mother, and when he rolled over, there was, like, a skull. Her face was a skull. And oh. once he, like, took a deep breath, looked at it, it kind of, like, dissipated in front of him. Whoa. And he woke up and he was like, whoa, what's going on? And my mom woke up and she was trying to, like, you know, figure out why was he kind of, you know, going crazy. Yeah. And, <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much the end of the story, but right. um, I just thought that was something something weird. He also said that the house that we lived in, I believe was haunted. I, I used to see figures walking around in the end of my bed at night when I was a kid. I had sleep paralysis there way too often. Oh. And uh, there was a lot of weird stuff that happened in that house. Yeah. That's but, creepy. Um, also here in Southern Maryland, uh, there's a lot of like historical, you know, like slavery buildings and stuff that's actually at our parks here. And uh, Indian different, you know, camps that Indians were at and things like that. Uh -huh. And my aunt, when they were younger, um, <clears throat> there was a place actually called Point Lookout that's not too far from me. And it's been on a couple of Discovery Channel shows of being like one of the most haunted places in the U.S. Oh. And they were camping there. They were overnight fishing. And she said she woke up in her tent in the middle of the night. And she was surrounded by, like, soldiers marching. You Ooh. know, none of them looked at her or anything like that. They were just, you know, she could see through them, but she said they were, it was crazy. <laughs> and she was like, the first thing I did was wind my windows up. And I'm like, that didn't help at all. <laughs> wow. But, um, yeah, there's, there's been some pretty crazy things here. Um I personally, myself, have had a dog bad experience. I haven't heard too many of those experiences in this area, but wow. uh, me and a buddy had an experience uh, in the woods quite deep and a couple miles in, and there's kind of an open field area, and the grass gets pretty high. We actually call it Jurassic Park because it doesn't look like any other area around here. Okay. And uh, it was midsummer, and this, we were just sitting there because there was like a bike trail that we were riding around. Uh -huh. And we were at the top of the hill and we saw like this black figure stand up. And I thought, first thing I thought, because, you know, I'm almost 40. So the first thing I thought was Bigfoot because at the time that's all I knew. I was like, oh, it's a Bigfoot. But then we saw ears on it. Mm -hmm. And this was broad daylight. This had to be 2 o'clock in the evening. I mean, I remember it was like summer break okay and it's chest above the grass and the grass is at least like four foot tall back there and its chest area was above that so i was like this thing and we just booked it and well i mean he booked it because he left me <laughs> but <laughs> we, we took off on our bikes down the power lines and there's so many experiences that we had down those power lines and i think that there's really something going on when it comes to Power lines because I hear it a lot of times in other shows, and every time that we've been back there by the power lines, there's been something weird going on back right. there every uh -huh. time. Every time, wow! And there is something about power lines that does seem to be another magnet spot for uh, you know, especially the cuts where they make through wild areas, right. those power line paths. Exactly. That's uh, uh, some reason. And, and, uh, Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Well, at the time, it was all horses back there. There was no houses. There was a farm off to the left side of the trail, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a half mile or so off into the woods. But there was 
nothing back there. So it was just all force. It went straight through, you know, dense forest. And we used to just ride our bikes back there. We were kids exploring. Wow. You know know how kids are. Oh, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So (laughs) there was a lot of weird things that happened back there, a lot of weird things. Yeah, no doubt. That's bizarre. I, I so when I'm you guys it took me so long. oh it's okay I'm glad I'm, when when you guys rode away did you get the sense that it pursued it all or did it just kind of watch you go oh no absolutely I heard if you if you've ever been around horses or anybody oh, sure. you know how they have like a sound that they kind of make yeah we heard that behind us and on those power lines a lot of times it's like gravel it's not. You know, it's dirt, but it's gravel. And we heard the gravel, you oh. know, behind us, you know, as if something was chasing us and it was kind of tumbling down the hill because it's a very, you know, up and down, up and down hilly area. Sure. And, you know, people rode their dirt bikes back there, you know, purposely for that reason. Right. So, you know, we heard it, but once it got, geez, I don't know, because there's a creek back there too. Once it got to about the creek area where we were crossing, it stopped, and I don't know if it turned around or whatever. I did not plan on looking. I was, yeah, <laughs> I no heard doubt. it. I could feel it breathing, and I was just like, I'm out of here. My buddy already left me. He was like, yeah. And when I got back to the house, the first thing I said was, dude, why didn't you tell me this thing was coming? <laughs> but um, I can laugh at it now, but right. definitely at the time, I, I was I was making a mess of my pants. <laughs> I don't blame you, brother. Taco man. Bell night. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. That's intense. Really intense. It, oh, but like I was going to say, I apologize. I, I have meant to uh, call in earlier with stories because I have a ton of stories from Maryland and Virginia and the South. You know, for my family, we have a lot of history and mm-hmm. there's a lot of history here in this area. It, it's It's crazy. So. Um, I don't know. I might call in a few more times. I don't want to take up too much of your time, and I hope everybody enjoyed what little bit of stories I shared tonight. But Yeah, brother. Thank you so much, uh, and, and feel free to call in any time, man. would love to hear more. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you guys, I love you guys' show, man. The chat is always amazing, yeah. <laughs> and uh, keep up the good work, guys. All well, right. it's, it's great to finally meet you, brother. Thanks for calling in and being a part of the show. Thank to you. All, All right. right. Have a great night. Well, there you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks. That's cool. All right. So we got a vid- uh, video sent in from Ruger. Well, he's, she, it's so, yeah, that's, that's his EVPs that he's been talking about. Yeah. We well, should close on that, huh? Sure. Let's close on this uh, video from our good friend, Mr. Ruger Ridge from his YouTube channel, which is also called Ruger Ridge. And, uh, this is a, an EVP that uh, comes from, well, it's posted on the 14th. I don't know what, when they come from exactly. I guess we got a... It was just a few days ago. Just was, a few days yeah. ago. Uh, thanks to Ghost Magnet for helping to clean this up. Awesome. And thanks for your help on that, Ghost Magnet. But uh, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Let me go full screen on this. And uh, we'll listen to Ruger Ridge and, and his EVPs. Let's have a listen. All right. And play. I've seen a big hairy thing that walks upright like a man. It walks upright like a man. Do you know what that is? seen a big hairy thing that walks upright like a man. It walks upright like a man. Do you know what that is? I can hear like a breathy thing in there. Like that. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, I think that's very cool. Thank you for doing that. Hey, look at what comes up next. (laughs) Comes up next. Three, two, one. No, 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 I don't want to watch us. 
We're already ready to start no, eating healthier. No, we're not ready. Meet cachava. We're not ready. Cachava is the world's. There we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it, folks. Um, this has been a presentation of the Paranormal Portal, and we hope you had a good time. Yep. Don, anything in closing? Good night, Mom. Good night, Mom. <laughs> Did she? Oh, she's saying good night. Yep. Well, she's saying great show, of course. Aw, uh, thank you, awesome. Mom. Uh, it makes makes me happy. All right, and uh, hope you guys had a good time as well. Uh, remember, if you're not subscribed, please get subscribed. If you want to help support the show, you can donate, uh, or you can look down below the show. There should be a shelf showing Paranormal Portal gear. If you'd like to be the proud owner of our logo or one of our amazing designs, you can check out that or check out the full site on Teespring. The link is in the description as well. That's right. Um, and uh, please, we'll look for you on Friday night. We'll be back. Don, you'll be here, right? Friday night, I plan to be. Your plans to be here. That's, the way. That's a good start. So hope you guys had a great time. We love you all. Remember that. Please be good, be nice, be kind. Help each other out. Oh, Drew is Ochi Ochimaru. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. What's yeah. happening, Ochi? <laughs> Orochimaru. Yeah. Yep. Good to see you again, Drew. Thanks for coming back and being a part of our family again. Um, but remember, we love you all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other. Help each other out. Find the magic in every day. And remember to laugh as much as you can. We'll be back Friday night, folks, right here on YouTube, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Hope to see you then. Until then, take care of yourselves. Be careful. Keep your head on a swivel and get a dash cam. Get a dash Just saying, cam. Get a dash cam. Get a dash cam. <laughs> good night. All right. Good night, everybody.